Let me introduce you to Catherine Harris. She will speak to you on her topic of diagnosis and treatment. Catherine Harris is a 2022 Leslie's Week honoree. She graduated from Otterbein University in 2005 with a bachelor's degree in fine arts and sociology. Due to an incurable curiosity, Catherine has remained a student throughout her life, enrolling in continuing education courses, traveling, and participating in international meditation groups. She is incredibly proud of her two children, Felix and Harris, who often help her where she is happiest, creating art all over her home and community. Catherine volunteered to curate a new program for Leslie's Week in 2024. It's called the Leslie's Week Kids Gallery of Dreams exhibition and will be held at the Stage 4 Change 2024 conference and that wall collapses and that room will be an exhibit of all the artwork our Leslie's Week kids create in our Club for Kids each year at our retreat for Stage 4. And you have got to see this art. Uh, Grace Higley, where are you? Right there. Grace is collecting the art. And uh, it's going to be an exhibit. And thank you, Catherine. Where are you? Please join us. Hello. My name is Katie Harris, and I'm an artist, a mom of two great kids, an NBC Thriver, a flatty, which means I have no boobs, and I'm one of the luckiest people on the planet, for which I am personally very grateful. Honestly, it might seem like there's some conflicting statements going on there, but I think after I share some of my story with you, you'll understand what I mean. I was asked to speak on the topic of diagnosis and treatment, and I'm going to focus on the diagnosis part because I'm guessing many of you are more familiar with the treatments that are given to breast cancer patients than experiencing um, being diagnosed with breast cancer. I've had a few experiences with this, uh, three of which I would like to share with you today. It was January of 2017, and um, my youngest had been born in February of 2015. I'd been done breastfeeding for some time, but my body had not gotten that message. So every time I was out in public and a baby cried, I had kind of a, a problem on my hands, and I did not have a PCP doctor at the time, but my sister had one she loved and recommended, so I went to go see her. And when I told her about the issue, she had questions like, does the breast milk smell strange? Um, does it have an odd color? Uh, any, any lumps or bumps? And I said, no, it's just perfectly normal breast milk. I was just hoping at some point it might stop. Um, and she did a breast exam. She noted that my mom and grandmother both had breast cancer. My mom had genetic testing done and had none of the known breast cancer genes. But here's where you get to see some of my luck come into play. <laughs> um, this lovely doctor said, this could be perfectly normal and probably is. However, I personally think that when there's a strong family history, even if the genetic testing doesn't show any of the known breast cancer genes, that the recommendation to start mammograms at 40 is too late. I've been seeing more and more young women with breast cancer being diagnosed under the age of 40, and so I'm going to put that there is suspicious discharge, and I'm gonna use this as an excuse to get you a mammogram. So she used her experience, and she trusted her instincts, and she ordered a test that I technically did not meet the requirements for. 
I went in for my mammogram, and in February, they let me know that there is a small amount of calcification on the right side that was perfectly within the normal range. They wanted me to follow up in six months to do another mammogram, and if it looked ex the same, we would know that that was my normal, and we would have that established as my baseline. Six months later, things went very, very differently. Uh, they immediately wanted to do an ultrasound and then two biopsies right there. I was scared, but I got some really good pictures of the metal straw going into my boob to share with my mom, so that was exciting. <laughs> um, it turns out that I got a call from my oncologist a couple days later, um, letting me know that I had developed two separate but small tumors in my right breast and um, it was triple positive. There was gonna need to be a lot of appointments. I got off the phone with her and I just sobbed. I was upstairs putting away baby clothes when she called and I laid on the floor and I, I shouted. I hadn't heard anything after the cancer part. So after a while I washed my face and I poured a, a very large glass of wine and I got out a notebook and pen and I called my doctor back so that I could get more of those details and really write them down. Um, and I had my first big shock soon after that of the medical world which was we were going to fight this cancer with surgery first in two months. <sighs> I wanted to get the cancer off of me and as far away from me as quickly as possible had I not just grown two tumors in six months. It seemed pretty aggressive, so why were we waiting at all? I was told that this was fine and, and completely normal and um, we have to schedule surgeries this far out. It was not an emergency. So during the pre-op scans, uh, before my surgery two months later, they located three areas on my left breast that they would now like to biopsy that hadn't previously been a problem. So my plans quickly changed to being a bilateral mastectomy. And although my nodes came back clear, this was obviously not the end of my cancer journey. So I was re-diagnosed stage four in August of 2020. COVID was in full swing, doctor's appointments were online, and I was not due to be scanned again until December. Things had been going very well. A pain started in my right flank in August, and I tried to ignore it, but it kept getting worse until I really wasn't able to get out of bed and move around. I didn't want to go to the emergency room on a Saturday night during a global pandemic, and it was as bad as you might expect. So about 16 hours later, I was able to get a bed and get some tests done, and um, the ear doctor came to speak with me pretty quickly after that. He said that your blood work, your ear analysis, and CT scans came back. We honestly have no idea what is causing the pain. However, we did see other things, um, and we're able to get a hold of your oncologist who would like to add you to our appointments on Tuesday, um, and we're really, really sorry. Um, we're really sorry and then they gave me copies of my CT scans to take home with me and sent me home from the ER. And so I got to read all about what we could see in my lungs and had a good idea of what we would talk about on Tuesday when I saw my oncologist. We had to confirm, but it did seem that the cancer had been metastasizing. And after a PET scan, we were able to see that it was in my lungs, my liver, and bones. Biopsies confirmed it was breast cancer. The only way that we could see anything in my liver was with a PET scan, and I've never been approved to get a PET scan since. My insurance company deemed it not medically necessary, and when my doctor tried to argue the point that we can't monitor how the liver lesions are responding to treatment without it, they hung up on her. It seems fairly absurd that they hung up on a doctor advocating for a scan for a, to monitor a stage four cancer patient. Honestly, I was very angry the first time around and I was angry when I was diagnosed again. I thought I had beat cancer. I had rang the bell and everything. I did everything my doctors asked of me. 
I didn't even know I was angry the first time around. It was only after my psychic diagnosis that I began to understand how angry I was and identifying that and learning how not to live with it was the best gift I've ever given myself. I had to do chemo alone the second time around because of the pandemic and I felt very alone. My oncologist has known me for a long time now and she doesn't give me a lot of statistics unless I ask. She knows that bad news makes me a bad listener, so I need time to process. And she's watched me grow from someone who showed up in 2017 for chemo, saying I'm ready for my poisoning, to me now, six years later, bald, nauseous, tired, and grateful to receive treatments, eager to spread kindness to everybody I meet. My third diagnosis, bones, liver, and lungs, but I still have my brain, was a frequent refrain of mine as I was navigating my thriver life. At the time, I thought I was focusing on the positive, but in retrospect, I realized how scared I was of the cancer crossing the blood-brain barrier. I really like my brain. I am and have always been a giant nerd. I like learning and reading and seeing and creating, and because I was so scared of it, I consider finding out that it had moved to my brain to be my third diagnosis. One of my incredible chemo nurses was pregnant when she asked me the usual questions. Have you had any falls since your last visit? Any changes in vision or hearing, headaches? I let her know that I had been having headaches. That's all. She said that was unusual for me and I agreed. She made a point to let my oncologist know and I had been asked a lot of things like, are there any vision changes, hearing changes, dizziness? Nope, it's just headaches. Um, so we didn't really follow up on it, but five months later, after this nurse had come back from her maternity leave and had me again, she asked me about the headaches. Has nobody followed up on it? You're still having the headaches? And I said, yeah, and she's, she'd been a chemo nurse of mine in 2017 as well. So she's known me for some time. And she didn't like the way it sounded, so she called my oncologist and reiterated to her that she felt it was important for me to have a brain scan, and my oncologist agreed. So we did a brain MRI and found out that I had a 1.8 by 2 centimeter lesion in my brain. On October 14th, 2021, three days before my oldest son's birthday, it was a big hit. Um, I, I did appreciate the urgency, though, this time around. It was not two months before I had surgery. We did it less than two weeks later while I had COVID. They thought my symptoms being not so severe, the bigger risk was leaving the brain tumor. It's like a dark and endless roller coaster. It's up and down and scary and less scary and constantly moving without knowing where you're off to. And for some reason, you have your kids and your family and the cars behind you along for the whole fucked up ride. It's not the cancer that's scary, per se. It's all of the unknown. At the end of the day, though, it's no different than being scared of the dark. My children were two and three years old when I was first diagnosed with cancer. It's all they've ever known. They used to help me clear my drains after my mastectomy and then pockets of fluid uh, built up in my chest and became infected and had to be cleared out and cauterized down. And then a few days later, my port became infected and I was septic. And the skin where the surgery was over my chest, it wouldn't stay closed. Um, my three and four year old would help the home health care worker who would come by every couple days to change the dressing on the wound vac I carried around for three months. And they helped me change my IV bags for my portable pump that I carried around for two months with constant antibiotics. And they tell me I'm pretty when my hair falls out. <laughs> and they joke with me about how much I sleep after my treatments. And they call me Snorlax, which is a Pokemon who sleeps all the time. <laughs> my oldest is very responsible. And I frequently have to remind him that he is not an adult and he doesn't have to take on so much. My youngest holds my face at night and makes me promise I will wait for him in the star place so that we can come back together in the next life. And I assure him we will always find each other. These are my tales of being diagnosed with cancer. It is really hard to try to write a 15 minute speech that tells you my whole story. 
it's hard to stay on track. When I really look back on the things, what jumped out at me, though, was how lucky I am to be here at all. I had the good fortune to cross paths with a doctor who ignored the rules in 2017 to find my cancer in the first place, lucky that a mystery pain sent me to an emergency room when my cancer was spreading, and lucky that nurses who provide me with my treatments take the time to know me as a person and trust me as a person when I say something's off. So many times I could have slipped through the cracks in our medical system. I've had years and maybe still have years as a result. Which is great news for me, but women should not have to be lucky to be diagnosed with cancer. If I had access to PET scans like my doctors had wanted in 2020, I might not have needed the craniotomy in 2021. The majority of the incredible thrivers I met at Leslie's Week were diagnosed in Nova, cancer all over their bodies long before insurance finds a mammogram to be medically necessary. And when we grapple with the new stage for life we have before us, cancer now a part of every plan, looming in every dark corner, we are at the mercy of a cold system that can deny us scans and treatment options that are literally life and death. After being diagnosed with stage four breast cancer, you learn things like metastatic breast cancer patients have to wait two years after being on social security to become eligible for Medicare. Do you have any idea how long it is to wait two years after a stage four diagnosis? And the numbers. They don't make sense. I live in Columbus, Ohio. Does it help you know what the weather is like there today if I tell you that the average temperature in Columbus is 63 degrees? Because it was 104 one day this summer and literally negative seven one day in December. <laughs> so it's a pretty poor way to learn about the weather there. If you're trying to learn about breast cancer patients by looking at numbers, you'll be doing everyone a disservice. Insurance providers, please trust the doctors to order scans and provide treatment. And doctors, please trust your patients when they tell you something is wrong. There is no one way the disease presents itself. And if we plan to fight it properly, then our solutions need to be as creative and tenacious as the women it affects. Every woman with stage four has their own story of diagnosis. And if they're under 40, they often had to fight like hell to be taken seriously in the first place. We have to do better. I don't want anyone else with stage four cancer to have to stand up here and tell you how lucky they are. Thank you. <laughs>